Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Crossref annual meeting. Going to wait for people to jump in. See, we're up to 25 or so. We've had 600 registrants for this, and I'm sure not all of you will join live, but <laughs> we'll at least wait for a few more. Welcome everybody to the Crossref Annual Meeting. My name is Ginny Hendricks. I'm Director of Community at Crossref and uh, Johansson Obanda is uh, helping in the chat and with any questions uh, that people might have about uh, sound or other quality issues. Okay. Two minutes past, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and people can catch up as and when they join. Uh, so let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. All right, can someone give me a thumbs up that you can see my slides, virtual or otherwise? Thank you, Cora. Okay, welcome everybody to uh, the 2023 annual meeting of Crossref. Um, we have a very full agenda today, which I'll go through in a minute. Um, but first of all, I want to remind people about the Code of Conduct, uh, which is on our website, crossref.org slash Code of Conduct. Um, please join the conversations on social media. Um, we have our uh, Mastodon uh link and if you must use twitter slash x then uh, we're also monitoring that as well if you have questions uh throughout please use the q a box because there's uh there's one person presenting and there's a, a technical contact in the background who is um, making sure everything's going to plan and also selecting questions uh to be answered live so any questions that you have for me uh yeah uh, please put them in the q a box which is about there on your screen and yes, uh, before you ask the first question, the slides and recordings will be shared afterwards. Okay, so here's the uh, the running order of the day. We're going from uh, 9.30 to five o'clock UTC time. Uh, we are at the top one, so this is the welcome, and I'm gonna give a little rundown of the research nexus. Uh, we're having um, updates from the community uh, twice. So after uh, my session in about 25 minutes, and then later today at three o'clock as well. And in between that, we'll have product demonstrations. We'll have a um, uh, a uh, discussion panel about challenges and uh, opportunities with the research nexus. And the most important thing is that we will have the results of our board election. So we do this meeting every year so that we are fulfilling our sort of community governance uh, promises. And everyone has been busy voting for the last couple of months. And uh, we will hear the results of that at two o'clock uh, this afternoon, UTC time. Okay. Uh, if you haven't voted and you are a member uh, and you're the voting contact for your membership account, then please do um, email your vote to lucy at crossref.org. Uh, if you have voted and you would like to change your vote, please also email Lucy. So the voting closes at one o'clock, which is an hour before we will um, give the results. So it gives Lucy a chance, a uh, bit of time to uh, collate any any late entries. Uh, so yeah, these are our um, our candidates for the 2023 board slate. Uh, a nice range, five seats for smaller members and two seats for larger members. Okay, I am now going to talk through the research nexus. And first of all, I will define what we mean by that. Um, I think everybody's very familiar with this diagram by now, where we have lots of objects and entities in the center, um, a lot of uh, emphasis in the community on persistent identification of objects and entities, both inputs and outputs uh, of research. And all of these should have uh, identifiers and they're very important, uh, but they are not enough alone because we want to um, 
more and more track and connect the things that are happening to those objects, how they're related to each other and what happens to them over time. And this is what we call the research nexus. So around the outside, you've got sort of the research workflow from funding, creation, posting, feedback through to reuse. And uh, we want a better view of relationships. So that's really the crux of, of my talk this morning. Um, we want to expose kind of what has traditionally been internal information a bit more publicly, like who is doing the depositing, who's hosting um, the records and things like that. And the whole point is to establish provenance. And so there's this evidence trail uh, and to see connections between different objects, uh, not just identifying and, and accessing them. And I would say that uh, a lot of this is possible. Um, we talk about metadata participation quite a lot. And uh, I will show you some stats about how that is really improving, along with a big thank you to lots of uh, members for their efforts in that area. Um, the rest of this is quite aspirational, uh, but it gives an idea of the direction of travel uh, for Crossref and what we're trying to build uh, as we're uh, remodeling our, our data. OK, a little word uh, with a lot of numbers <laughs> on the scale of the Crossref infrastructure. So we have uh, more than 19,000 members now, and they are coming from 152 countries. Um, that has been growing. We get about 200 new members every month. Um, so, yeah, 2,400 a year on average the last few years, and that's sort of steadily growing. Um the number of records that these members are registering with Crossref, we hit the 150 million um, mark earlier this year. It sort of happened very quickly, I think, thanks to lots of book chapters from Oxford University Press. So we, we kind of, uh, kind of, kind of came came quickly. Uh, but even more important than the number of records is how much they are used. So we've been monitoring the total DOI resolutions every month. Um, the total is about 1.3 billion and 1.1 billion of those are Crossref DOI. So that's somebody clicking on those DOI links or systems uh, following those links. Um, so the use of the of the Crossref uh, infrastructure is, is, yeah, it's growing uh, hugely. Um, so following the DOI links is one way that the infrastructure is used. The other way is uh, through queries of our of our API. So um, we don't always know it's anonymous uh, and fully open our, our API and our search form. We try not to track people too much, um, but that sees even more. So 1.2 billion queries every month on our APIs. That's actually increased um, uh, it's more than uh, it's about doubled, actually, in the last five years. So it's about just over 600 million in uh, 2018. Uh, we have now 150 organizations that are helping members uh, participate in Crossref. We call them sponsors, uh, which makes them sound like a fiscal kind of arrangement. But really, it's uh, support, language, um, uh, support and XML help and things like that. And we also have 50 ambassadors now uh, in the community. Uh, another word on the scale of Crossref is how much we are budgeting for all of this data storage and processing, so access to the APIs and stuff, and that's going to be over a million dollars in 2024. Uh, there'll be more on finances later from Lucy and Ed. And uh, another uh, sort of data point is that we are now 47 staff uh, and we cover seven time zones and we live in, uh, we live across 10 different countries. So this hopefully gives a flavor of kind of how Crossref has grown as an organization as well as uh, as an infrastructure. Um, I'm afraid I have quite a few slides with lots of numbers, so hopefully that floats your votes. Um, yeah, this is normally uh, I do a sort of annual year to year change, um, but this time I've decided to do a five year change. Actually, one of uh, some of the board members asked for this um, to see trends over a longer period. So we're looking at October 2018 and the change to October uh, 2023 this month. So these these figures in the and in this uh, column are the latest. And I just would highlight some of the ones that have grown uh, fastest, maybe. It's interesting that actually the number of records registering, the growth has actually slowed. It, it used to be, um, 
you know, 13% increase every year. Uh, that slowed uh, now to about 8% uh, from 2022 to 2023. Um, that is probably partly due to the fact that lots of the larger, uh, more established publishers have been working on their back files and they're kind of coming to the completion of those projects. Um, another one I would highlight is this next yellow line down, which is the uh, the number of preprints. So five years ago, there were just, just 79,000 and now there's one and a half million more than that. And we've just had uh, an input of a lot of preprints from the American Association for Cancer Research. So that's given a, a more recent bump uh, in the number of preprints there. Uh, peer review reports doesn't get that much attention, actually, but it has been growing actually very steadily so because it was quite new five years ago uh it looks like a huge a huge percentage but the numbers are still uh relatively uh small uh but we'd love to see more of those peer review reports being uh registered and linked up with the items they are reviewing uh and then i would uh call out the number of grant records very, very new in 2018. So just a handful of grants were created. They were probably test ones from Welcome uh, via Europe PMC, we think. Uh, so I can't even read out the percentage increase, but uh, we have almost, I think, 90,000. Uh, and that sort of doubled actually in the last year, uh, mainly thanks to the European Commission that have joined um, and adding all of their Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe um, uh, projects to the record um, and we'll hear from them at, in a flash talk uh, in the community section later actually in this afternoon session. So these are the records, these are items with Crossref DOIs. Um, now I would like to talk about the connections and as I mentioned the relationships are going to be really a big part, that's the focus of the research nexus um, and again uh, I want to highlight preprints uh, the number of links from preprints to articles uh, has really increased uh, 3000 um, percent. And that's just more print preprints are being uh, registered. And it is an obligation of those uh, members to uh, respond to our notifications and make sure that they link, update the metadata and link through to the version of record. Um, ORCID auto updates um, has been around probably for about seven or eight years. And it's going really well. I think the last few years, it's actually seen a little bit of a of a uh, uh, an increase in the, in the growth. And this year, we reached three million authors granting Crossref permission to update their ORCID record. Um, so yeah, in total, sixteen million works have been updated through Crossref uh, to the ORCID records. Um, a little word on uh, retractions. Um, a lot of emphasis on that and uh, most of you or many of you may uh, recall uh, last month we announced our acquisition of the retraction watch database so they will be included in the in the mainstream uh, API in the coming year uh, but for now it's a CSV file download so these numbers are just the uh, just the ones that have been registered by Crossref members not asserted by Retraction Watch um, so the numbers are still relatively small but it has grown over the last five years and I know um, uh, a lot of publishers are really concerned with making sure that these retractions are uh, fully linked up and in in the metadata uh, on record. Uh, and then adoption. So a little word about like what kinds of metadata are people uh, seeming to focus on the most and uh, actually references that first line um, has gone up. It's more than doubled in the last five years. So I think it was probably about a third of members that were providing references five years ago. And now it's about half of members. So that has increased. Um, abstracts have increased massively. And I would just um uh, mentioned the uh, I4OA, the Initiative for Open Abstracts, uh, that was founded by some researchers and a um, bit of support from Crossref and also some publishers like the Royal Society and SAGE. Um, and they've been uh, uh, focused on trying to get more abstracts into the system and opened up. Uh, and most recently, Wiley added all abstracts for all of theirs. So that probably accounts for the most recent jump in the number of abstracts. 
uh, I'm afraid I have more data, <laughs> but it's not about uh, it's not about uh, the metadata itself necessarily. It's just uh, looking at coverage information by member. So when we talk about uh, participation, we have these reports. There are nine checks, and our API has a coverage section. So, uh, which includes percentages. So for each member, you can access from the API, the uh, kind of average participation across all of those different metadata elements. And I thought I would do a little top 15. Um, so uh, yeah, other than about two or three, every single member here is a Korean society, which is why I've got the South Korean flag um, highlighted on the slide. So uh, thank you and well done to South Korea as a, as a country because the the focus on metadata completeness is really um, is really strong there, um, and yeah we want to see other other members rising up to the the sixties and seventy percent of uh, of completeness of their records. Um, I then limited to only the largest publishers, so any member that has more than fifty thousand records with Crossref. And you can see these are maybe perhaps more recognizable uh, globally. Um, and you know, some of the very large ones are uh, Sage, Sage, for example, with 3 million records and uh, really quite good and increasing coverage. I would call out as well the American Society for Microbiology. We, we called them out um, uh, a few months ago, back in March, uh, when Deborah Plavin and uh, David Haber wrote a blog post for us. So if you are a Crossref member and you'd like to increase your uh, participation, um, and by that we mean increase the completeness of the uh, of the metadata records, then um, take a look at this blog post. Um, I think Abanda might have the link ready to post, hopefully. Um, and of course, we'll share all the links afterwards anyway. Um, but this was a really good story about how they identified it was important and then started a project, really focused on it, and actually saw uh, quite a lot of positive outcomes uh, for the usage of their of their works. Uh, all of this information, as I said, is available via our API. Uh, 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 the Crossref Labs team has also put together a sort of a, a notebook, I think. So there's um, some tables you can interrogate. You can even download a CSV file of all members and all of their participation across uh, the nine uh, uh, sort of primary metadata checks that we do. Uh, and that link is at the bottom uh, of, the, of, the, of the screen there, member-metrics.fly.dev. And that is uh, a, a prototype. It's a labs project. So it's, uh, it may be slightly out of date um, and don't all rush there at once. Okay, I keep talking about relationships. So here's some examples of the most um, the most used relationships in the metadata records. Uh, what's really nice to see is that translations are growing. Um, this number was very very low uh, before, and they've actually grown. Uh, this so this is over the last eighteen months, so the last year and a half. Uh, is translation of has increased by over I think that's sixty five percent. Uh, preprints we've already mentioned, but all of these relationships cover, I would say, preprints, uh, data uh, relationships, uh, versions and peer review. So is comment on uh, is uh, a peer review uh, relationship type. Um, and yeah, the numbers are quite low. Members don't seem to be asserting lots of stuff in the relationships part of the schema, but it is increasing and we would love to see uh, more of those, which really does build the research nexus uh, more fully. Um, the other thing to note is if one party asserts uh, a relationship, Crossref uh, inserts the uh, reciprocal relationship. Um, and one place where we're doing that is with funding relationships. So for many years now, we've been supporting uh, funding information in uh, in the publication metadata and that is increasing as well. We're getting more um, funding data through from publications from publisher members. Uh, we've also, um, so we've been linking these uh, objects and focusing on this for, for a number of years. Um, and this is the search form. So if you go to search.crossref.org slash funding, that's where you can search for any funder and find all of the um, 
uh, publications or uh, yeah, uh, preprints or um, uh, items that have been registered uh, from researchers been funded by that one funder. Um, so this is the funding part of the research nexus. Um, we will, so what we've what we've seen so far is we're having uh, some funder members actually have asserted a has is financed or has financed um and we're we're then inserting the reciprocal relationship so we're starting to see some publication metadata um uh include uh is financed by uh and those are generally asserted by crossref because we've had the indication from the grant record um Sorry for the for the uh, the shock of all the the multi coloured screen, but these are the funder members of Crossref at the moment. Um, all of the different organisations that have joined Crossref and that are registering their grants. Um, grants are small in number but big in impact. Uh, so you know they might be high value grants. Um, but uh, so Welcome, for example, might have 100 grants a year, but it's billions, you know, in um, research funding. And uh, I've tried to organize them a little bit by um, sort of uh, charitable organizations on the left, uh, government organizations on the top right and um, the bottom, the bottom right are more the sort of um, private funders. Um, and yeah, we would especially love to see more government funders. Uh, but JST was the first. Um, we've got OSTI uh, that have been working with Crossref actually for a while. Uh, I think I mentioned the European Commission have added about 35,000 grants from the Horizon Europe project, uh, projects. Um, and the Dutch Research uh, Council and the Portuguese um, Council of Science and Technology also recently joined and are starting to add their grants. Uh, so that's really good to see, linking up, adding to the whole picture of uh, what's happening with research through metadata. Uh, still a little bit on the funders. It's a really good example of um, uh, adding more into the research nexus. Uh, here are some of the projects that we've been involved with. Uh, over the last uh, year or so, uh, the Fair Workflows project, which is led by Data Sites, we've contributed to that work, and uh, there's a guide that is um, draft. I'm just going to uh, mute while I cough. That did it. Uh, we have our own funder advisory group. We're on the Orchid Funder uh, Interest Group. We've also been. Um, helping with the OA switchboard uh, pilot, which is a, sort of a smaller, uh, more specific project. Um, and we're quite involved with the Open Research Funders Group. That's the uh, the top right. And they are, yeah, they're running a lot of projects actually to bring uh, funders um, along on this uh, sort of open metadata journey. Um, so how are we, uh, what, what is Crossref doing to support the, uh, um, the growth of, of metadata and what's, what's in our pipeline? Um, this is a slide that obviously Patricia has made because there are rainbow unicorns on it. So thank you for that. And I think that's actually a pipe uh, there. But what it does show is uh, that in the labs team, we're building a pipeline so that we can test new schema changes uh, much more accurately. Um, and here uh, she's given us some bullet points of the projects that that she's looking at first, along with Martin Eve and, and, and others in the labs team. Uh, so looking at we're currently already testing alternate names. Uh, we are looking at uh, raw IDs for uh, to denote funders. So we're deprecating over time the open funder registry. Uh, and we are. Uh, moving to the raw registry uh, instead, and that's going through testing. If you do have uh, interest in testing uh, that, then let us know. Um, and yeah, I we could probably come back to this in questions, but I will move on for now. Uh, there's a link to um, the community forum that Patricia's just put on, I think, yesterday, uh, asking for uh, testers for um, including raw IDs instead of funder IDs in the metadata. So if you're interested in that, then uh, you can respond to that post and contact Patricia.
Uh, so we talked about the metadata quite a lot in, in the Crossref uh, infrastructure and community, but um, I just wanted to talk about the people, the organizations as well. Um, this is uh, not a very scientific <laughs> um, chart, but it kind of shows like how we see our community. Everyone uses the metadata. Uh, of course, uh, members are there as a very big, um, uh, a very big group and you know, we have uh, a lot of collaborators that we work with. They might also be sponsors. And this just gives a kind of depiction of the crossover between the, the Crossref community members uh, and how we work with them. Uh, we, earlier this year in January, we launched the Global Equitable Membership Program uh, that covers uh, fee waivers for 59 countries. So that's a zero membership fee, but also zero content registration fees. Um, and we started that based on the International Development Association list. And it's great that we've had uh, over 350 uh, GEM members now since we launched the program in, in January. Um, so the goal really is actually about building out the research nexus. We want to lower or keep you know the barriers very very low to participation from some of the least economically uh, advantaged countries in the world um it is worth saying that it's only really necessary to have waiver programs if the fee model isn't quite up to scratch uh we haven't changed our fees in I think probably close to 18 years. Um, Ed will correct me, I'm sure, if that's not the case, but it's it's certainly more than 15 or 16 years. Uh, so clearly the community has evolved um, and changed dramatically over, over 20 years or even just over the last 10 years. And we will be um, uh, starting a consultation project in 2024 uh, which will include fee remodeling, and that's going to be a, a really, um, a really consultative uh, project. So we'll be uh, working through our membership and fees committee, and there'll be surveys and focus groups and all sorts of activities to figure out what the right size uh, of Crossref should be going forward, and uh, how we're keeping that sustainable. Um, so fees are likely to change uh, in a couple of years' time. And yeah, speaking of, of countries, uh, I think uh, we say this every year, Indonesia is winning at, at, at Crossref membership. Uh, 504 new members from Indonesia, Indonesia so far this year. Um, and you can see some of the most kind of developing uh, uh, areas as well joining. And it's really nice to see some countries in this sort of uh, top uh, list for the first time. Bangladesh, I think, uh, Ecuador, um and yeah some of the usual suspects like the united states and uh the united kingdom uh so yeah i think that is me so i'm happy to take any questions if if we have time i may have left one or two minutes There are no open questions. Okay, did I miss anything in the chat? Anything people want to dig into further? And if not, I will hand over to uh, the community updates session and whoever is hosting that one. <laughs> 